Okay, hello. Oops, yeah, it's kind of moving. All right. Um, so before I start, just a couple notes. One is you probably got my email about the Goodman book that it's um, on back order. So uh, it looks like it's not going to be possible for people to get that in time for the readings from it. So I'm going to um, put PDFs of the readings up on Canvas when I get a chance. Um, and uh, so speaking of Canvas, the, um, the other readings, including the reading from Thursday that are not from the assigned books, are up now. There are links to them on the syllabus, and you can find them directly on the Canvas site. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple of things about the reading for next time. Um, one is uh, um, what the two kind of important points in the reading for next time are. The, one is how the verificationist thesis, and I'm going to say more today about what verificationism is, but how the verificationist thesis of the Aufbau starts to change as we go forward in the history of logical positivism. And the other is the difference between Carnap and Neurath's approaches. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on when I talk about that reading. And, um, and the reading for next time is about what are called protocol sentences sentences. So by the way, you can see that someone in my household, possibly one of the cats, has changed some of the diagrams that I left on the board last time. This one was changed into someone in a basket on a parachute. And then this blog here was labeled after that. Anyway, <laughs> Protocol sentences and because I think the reading just kind of assumes you know what protocol sentences are supposed to be and then Carnap and Norat start arguing about what they are or which sentences are protocol sentences. So protocol in this context means like um, a notebook in which you write down minutes of a meeting or like uh, observations that happened in a lab or something like that. Um, right, it's famous or infamous from the title of that book, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, <laughs> which is supposed to be like the minutes of their meetings. Um, right, so when Carnap and Neurath argue about protocol sentences, they're arguing about what, um, like, the fictitious subject A in the Aufbau would uh, write down in their record of their experiences, which they're afterwards going to, like, work up into um, theoretical statements, etc. Um, and actually, Carnap does use the word protocol for this in the Aufbau, too. It's on page 1. 59, section 101. Um. Right, in order to apply the indicated fictional separation, we have to assume a further fiction, namely, that the given which has been experienced is not forgotten, but that A retains it in his memory or that he makes a protocol of it. Right? So that's what Neurath and Carnap are arguing about, about what kind of sentences would go in that protocol. Um, okay, as I said, all of that is just a preview of the reading for next time. Are there any questions about that? All right, so I'm going to go back and talk about this stuff. So, oh, there's also a sad face. All right. <laughs> um, 
So uh, the reason I didn't just completely erase this is that I'm going to begin by, if I don't want to spend too much time on it, I want to give a slightly more careful account of what's happening in sections 126 through 128 than I did in my rushed summary at the end last time. So again, this is the stage in the alphabet where Carnap is trying to um, make the transition from the auto-psychological realm, right, from, uh, from objects or concepts or relations that are about my experiences to the world of physical things which actually in German it just says the world of things. <laughs> um, so, but it means uh, basically like bodies that are subjects of sensible properties. It's kind of, it's related to what Husserl uh, early on calls the uh, realm of Cartesian imaginatio and later on calls the life world. Right, so it's not well. Anyway, it's a world of like bodies with, and especially what he thinks that he's proposing that we do first is construct bodies with colors on their surfaces. And in order to do that, um, there's so there's basically kind of like one fundamental relation that we're trying to introduce. Um, um, you might call it F. So the German word Farbe or color. So like, although Carnap doesn't call it that. I don't remember. I don't think he doesn't give it a symbol because it, this is also the stage where he stops giving the logistic symbolic representation of the constructional steps. But anyway, we call it F, and F is going to be a relation that takes, um, well, depending on how you look at it, let's say it takes two arguments, or you could say it takes five arguments because. One of its arguments is a point, and the other argument is a color. Well, I, think, I mean, this is the relation, but what we're going to fill into this argument place is points in space time. And what we're going to fill into this argument is colors. Now, colors have already been constructed at, at an earlier stage of the system, or are supposed to have been. Um, so we know what type of object colors are. And Carnap says points of space-time we're just regarding as n-tuples of real numbers. How much is n? Well, we know it's like in real life it's four. Right? That is the world we, we talk about in everyday life and in science, too, for many purposes, which consists of bodies with colored surfaces, has three spatial dimensions. And so if you add another dimension for time, that's four dimensions. So, um, so I mean, Carnap actually leaves it open in his rules how many dimensions we're going to need. Um, his, his rules end up requiring at least two because we've already determined that the visual field has two dimensions, again, at an earlier stage of the constructional system. Um, so it's going to require at least two spatial dimensions plus one for time, making three dimensions. So it's going to require at least three, but he's, you know, he's set it up so that uh, part of the process of constructing this is going to help us determine how many dimensions this has to be. Um, that part is interesting, but I'm, but, uh, I'm going to 
ignore it in trying to describe how this works. And in fact, I'm going to go back to what I did last time and assume that, imagine that our visual field only had one dimension. Right, so all we see is a line segment with colors on it. So in that case, um, two spatial dimensions are going to be enough to do what Carnap wants to do. So I'm going to assume, basically what he wants to do is allow bodies to be hidden behind each other. Um, so that's why it needs one more spatial dimension than the visual field. Um, so in other words, I'm going to assume that what we're trying to do based on this one-dimensional visual field is to construct a two-dimensional world of colored shapes with colors on their perimeter. And then we have to add another dimension for time, right? So as you go in this direction, you're going later and later in time. And this cross-section is the world at a particular time, our two-dimensional world at that time. And the reason I'm doing this is because that way I can draw it on the blackboard. All right, do, do people understand what we're trying to get to here? Is there a question? I'm sure like some people have more experience with n-dimensional spaces and whatever than others. So really, if you have a question, please ask now. OK, well, I'll, it's clear then. Um, so um, right, so, so yeah, so like I said, we can think of this relation as taking two arguments. The first argument is, so now we're assuming it's a um, uh, ordered triplet of real numbers, and the second argument is a color. Or you can think of it as having four arguments, three real numbers and one color. Um, um, I don't think it makes that much difference how we think of it. Oh, uh, Ryan. Oh, sorry, it's a direct message. Um, okay, I have a question from Mariana. Could you please explain why Carnap is developing these formula? I'm a little confused. hard to see the board. I'm sorry about that. Is it, I mean, it's hard to understand what I've drawn on the board or is it like out of focus or, oh, it's fuzzy. Hmm. I don't know why it's fuzzy. It's clear here. So the problem must be in between here and there. I'm, I don't know what to say. It's in focus. Yeah, OK. I think some people are having, it seems like some people are having connection issues, and that's why it's fuzzy. I don't know what to do about that. But I will try to explain again more clearly, because whether you can see the board or not, some people are definitely Um, yeah, when you watch it on YouTube, it's clear. Again, that's a sign that the problem is the connection. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. There's nothing I guess I can do about that uh, other than try to make everything bigger on the board. Okay, but anyway, as far as people being confused about what Carnap is doing here, I can try to, to restate this again. So, so Carnap wants to, I mean, so the goal is to have a predicate like, um, you know, 
to, to have a, a set of predicates we can use to describe bodies with colored surfaces in space. So it's going to be like, is a body with a colored surface, um, you know, has a color at this point on its surface, has this color at this point on its surface, um, is, you know, the so-and-so distant from some other body is moving past other, but you know, like all the stuff that we would use to, um, all the stuff that we would, the, the words that we already have in ordinary life to describe bodies with colored surfaces, right? He's trying to find the place for those in the constructional system. And he's starting from a point where the only words I have are for describing my own experiences. I see a certain color here now. Right? Which is going to be a matter of saying, like, that, that, again, this is my visual field. What I see all the time is a line. This, this is my own simplification, right? Carnap doesn't say this. What I see all the time is a line. And what I can say about it is something like, there's red on the far right of the line. There's green three places over. There's what you know things like that, right? So that's we're starting with that language, and we want to introduce this language that's going to allow us to say things like, "There's a red sphere three feet away in that direction." So, um, but Carnap says, "Okay, here's how we start doing that." we need a way to assign colors to points in space and time, right? The reason we need to assign colors to points in space, someone says, is it kind of like pixels? Well, uh, I mean, The point of pixels is that they're like discrete, right? I, I mean, I guess these would be discrete at least to begin with, in the, or maybe always in the alpha system, because there's only a finite number of colors here. Well, I, I don't know. He doesn't really, he doesn't really address that. Um, but but I guess you could say it's like. Um, I mean, what he's trying to do is like, let's say, you know, I show you a picture of a three-dimensional scene, and on the basis of it, you try to build the scene in three dimensions. Or in this case, I show you a picture of a one-dimensional scene, and on the basis of it, you try to build the scene in two dimensions. Um, So it's kind of, as far as computer graphics goes, it's kind of the opposite of the usual problem. Not that, that this, the opposite problem doesn't also sometimes have to be solved in computer graphics, but right, like normally you have, you know, like you have a description, a three-dimensional description of your Minecraft world, and you want to change it into a two-dimensional thing that you show on the user's screen. Here we're going the other way. We're starting only with a description of that visual field, and we're trying to, on its basis, decide what colors belong where in the whole space. Did that help? Like, at least explain how it's like pixels or how it isn't like pixels? <laughs> right, so again, so like, so, I mean, because once we have this, once we can say, stop saying, you know, red in, in, point, in like position three of the visual field at time t and start saying red three feet in that direction at time t, then finding bodies with colored surfaces is just going to be a matter of finding colored points that make a surface, which might be really complicated uh, but it's, um, there's nothing really mysterious about it, right? It's clearly, it's a property. If you have a distribution of colors in, in space, 
then it's like a property of that distribution where, if anywhere, it has colored surfaces, right? Like if all the points line up on a certain surface, then you, there you have a colored surface. Oh no, what just happened? Oh, not this again. <sighs> Someone says, what if an object is colorless? Right, so that's why I said Carnap is focusing, first of all, on constructing a visible world of things. So it's not going to contain everything that's contained in our ordinary world of sensible objects. Right, like something like glass. Right, I mean, so like uh, there's... Um, there may be things that Carnap hasn't thought out completely here. Um, I mean, so first of all, I was thinking of something like air, so you don't see it at all. I mean, actually, he doesn't really, like, he doesn't really address what would have to be done with a situation like I'm looking through water. Um... He's, oops. Sorry, I'm back. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's best to, I mean, he's definitely, he's imagining the visual world as somewhat or a lot simpler than it actually is, right? As consisting of visible surfaces with colors distributed on them. Um, I mean, when you look at a piece of glass and there's a reflection and you also see some colors behind it, um, it is a, there isn't an obvious way to describe that in terms of colored surfaces. I mean, he does say that these colors are going to be, for the most part, assigned to the surfaces of bodies, not only. But, yeah, so anyway, I think, I mean, I think the main thing to say is this, that if this problem can be solved at all for this simplified visual world, or even if we can just, which is all he gets to anyway, gesture at how to solve it, Right? He doesn't really give a detailed way of solving it, he, despite all those criteria he lists. It's only the beginning of how to think about this. So, you know, if we can at least gesture at a way that this simplified problem might be solved, it's reasonable to think that the more complicated real problem could also be solved. But if we can't even do this, which is what Quine is going to claim, then there's no point in thinking about all the real complicated details of the visual world like the fact that it contains transparent and, and you know, like um, um, translucent things and so forth. Um, all right, and, and reflections and all that stuff. So just imagine that the world consists in these kind of, uh, you know, like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the children's program Pocoyo, but there's kind of like just these colored um, <laughs> uh, objects moving around, but they aren't really shiny or anything, <laughs> something like that. So, um, so, we're, so and in order to get to that, again, the key step is to somehow assign colors to, to um, points at times. So, um, so the basic thought, as I said near the end last time, is that Carnap is, looks at this as an optimization problem. That is, the way this relation F is going to be introduced is by saying, um, choose the F that makes this color distribution best by certain criteria. And then there's a whole list of criteria. And he gives two different versions of them. One of them, although he doesn't say this, 
I guess is supposed to be in the language of fictitious operations. It's not in the official logistic language, that's for sure. Um, and the other, the second one is in the realistic language. So like just to compare the first point on the two lists, um, Um, so people have a bad connection may also have trouble reading this text, but I'm going to read it out loud anyway. There is a series of prominent world points. I'm not sure if prominent is the right translation there. I should check what it says. But anyway, there's a, it's, yeah, there's a series of distinguished word, word point, world points, right? It's like, like, um, selected world points, which we call the points of view. They form a continuous curve in such a way that each of the n minus one space coordinates is a single valued continuous function of the time coordinate. Right, so that was this, um, line that I drew here. In this case, there's two spatial coordinates, n is three, and there's two spatial coordinates. So at every time, the point of view has two coordinates that say where it is in this plane. And the criterion is that um, the points, these points called the points of view should lie along a continuous curve. Right, which just means that as you go from one time to the next, the, the point of view doesn't suddenly jump from one place to another. Um, and then there's the description in the realistic language. The particular point in the interior of the head from which the world seems to be seen has its world has as its world line a continuous curve in the space-time world. So, right, so that is the realistic language says, so to speak, what this curve is supposed to end up being when we finish the constructional system, we'll be able to say that this, this, at a given time, this point represents where my point of view is. That's why we call it the point's point of view. So it's a point inside my head that everything seems to be seen from. It seems like he also should have said that we select a direction to look in at each point. Maybe he thinks that's taken care of by other things. I don't know, but anyway. So, um, right, and so the first list gives a whole bunch of criteria in terms of space-time coordinates and how they change and mostly requiring continuity or as close as we can come to continuity, making the derivatives small, that is things not changing too fast if we can help it. And all those things are supposed to, what do the, all those things apply to? They're all a way of testing when we put them all together. Um, we'll, uh, they'll tell us what this relation F is. No, sorry. Um, Altogether, they give a way of testing how good a given relation F is. Right? So, like, if the distribution of colors is such that I can't find a consistent, like, continuous point of view from which they all look like, or mostly look like colors on the surfaces of certain bodies, 
then it's not very good. But if I can find a, consist a continuous point of view from which this distribution looks, from, from which this field of view can be treated as looking at the world from this point, and the world contains these colored bodies that aren't moving too fast or jumping around or whatever, then that's going to be a good distribution. And we're going to choose the best one. And that's going to be the construction of this. So again, maybe to step back from the mathematical details, I feel like this is important enough to try to explain, and yet it takes so long, and I wonder if people are still confused when I'm done, that maybe I should give up on this in the future. But it, I mean, it's kind of cool what he's trying to do also. Um, you know, so, but like to step back from the mathematical details, the point is he's saying, um, we just like take, how are we going to assign points to colors to points out in a two dimensional space when I only have a one dimensional visual field? Well, you know, figure out the best way to do it so that that one dimensional visual field uh, looks like a window on a two dimensional world. So like imagine going back to the Minecraft example I was giving. Minecraft also actually, well, it does have transparent things, sort of, not really. Well, anyway, never mind. So, um, so uh, like imagine that, um, you know, you're given a series of still frames of that, you know, Minecraft world at different times. Um, and on the basis of that, you want to um, like build a model of it. So, you know, so the question is like, I mean, there would be different ways of interpreting those as a window on a three-dimensional world. Like, yeah, maybe this is a good way to explain it. Like, Suppose the first frame shows something like this, and the second frame shows So like there's various different three-dimensional worlds that could produce this sequence. For example, maybe all that's in a three-dimensional world is a flat board with these two pictures on it. Or maybe in a three-dimensional world there's a big cube and then there's part of a little cube which then uh, like shrinks so there's even less of it. Or maybe there's a big cube with a little cube behind it, and the little cube is moving, so in the second frame we see it more behind it. Right? So like those are those are three choices that will result in different um, or that those three choices amount to different choices of this relation F. Right? Like on the first one, I assigned all colors to the same plane. On the second one, I assigned the colors in space, but I didn't assign any colors to the, the I didn't assign any colors to like what's hidden behind this big cube. I assumed that there was that the little cube, you know, is only partial and there's nothing in back of the big cube. And then instead of saying that it moved, I said it shrunk so that like there's less of it now. That's why you see less of it. And on the third one, I'm assigning some colors that I can't see behind the big cube. And then in the second picture, I'm assigning more that I can't see behind the big cube. 
So those are three different ways of assigning colors to three-dimensional points based on the same two-dimensional sequence. And Carnap's idea of how to accomplish this is to say, well, we want the world to contain like stable bodies that move smoothly and not too fast relative to each other. And we want to assume that, you know, I'm moving smoothly as I look at it and so on and so forth. And um, the hope or, I mean, I guess what he would say is, um, clearly, at least most of the time, this problem can be solved because we solve it, right? That is, all the time when I'm looking out, I see this two-dimensional visual field, but I manage to come up with a unique three-dimensional world to explain it. So he's just trying to rationally reconstruct that process, right? Like what is it about this sequence of two-dimensional pictures that allows us to turn it into a sequence of three-dimensional moving bodies? And he's saying, you know, what we do is we try to find the best three-dimensional explanation of those two-dimensional pictures. And what does best mean? Well, it means, and then you get all that, those criteria of continuity and so forth. Does that, I see there's questions in the chat while I was going off on that. Okay, so there's three questions. Is Carnap trying to reach a point of agreement of what actually exists in the world that is separate from the 3D visual way that humans see the world? And the second question, it's kind of like his move to reduce everything to definite descriptions, right? And then the third question, is this analogous to the reduction of rational numbers to natural numbers? Okay, so, so, I'll, the, so the first question, is Carnap trying to reach a point of agreement of what actually exists in the world that is separate from the... Um, well, I'm not sure what you mean by agreement, but like he hasn't brought in other subjects for me to agree with or disagree with yet, if that's what you mean. But yeah, I mean, but he is trying to um, reach a unambiguous description of the world as it is in three-dimensional space based on the way I see it. And the way I see it is in projection on this two-dimensional visual field. So in the realistic language, you know, he says, uh, like, basically what I said at some point, we want the distribution of three-dimensional bodies that best explains what I see from inside my head and so forth. But in the... in Strictly speaking, in terms of the constructional system, the, point, the, 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 the problem here is to even introduce the predicate that says there's a color at a certain point in space. So I'm trying to find an unambiguous way of doing that. Carnap definitely loves math. Yes, yes he does. Someone says, I think I've heard this problem be called the inverse optics problem in perception. That sounds like a good name for it. <laughs> um, right, regarded as a mathematical problem, right? Regarded as a psychological question, how do we actually do it? Carnap is going to say, we don't have to get the details of that right. It just has to be a way that in principle we could be doing it based on the information we have. And that will suffice to put it into the constructional system. Um, so the other two questions from um, Ryan and Christopher, or I don't know if you go by Christopher or Chris uh, or something else. Um, but um, the other two questions are like, how does this fit into Carnap's overall method? And the answer is, um, it's not clear. So, 
a definite description comes into it, but let me first say why it's not clear. So it's not clear because this whole thing doesn't seem to tell you how to get rid of this relation. Right, when we, the, the, the construction of the rational numbers based on the natural numbers told you how to take, translate every sentence that's supposed to be about rational numbers into one that's about natural numbers that has the same truth conditions and then you, um, you know, use that instead. But this, although it's a very interesting idea of how to solve the inverse optics problem in perception, doesn't seem to tell you how to get rid of this. So I think Carnap does think it tells you how to get rid of this. And he thinks that it tells you how to get rid of this because he thinks that one of the legitimate logical symbols to use is, and it's called the definite description operator. By the way, like seriously, to the person who said Carnap really loves math, I mean, that's true. He does love math, but, but, you know, I mean, math is appropriate here, right? Like, I mean, we're talking about angles and distances and um, all that stuff. All right, sorry. So what I wrote is definite description operator. Let me try to write that bigger and more clearly. Get rid of And the definite description operator is something that you probably don't see in Phil 9, um, mostly because Quine doesn't like it. <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's way oversimplified in various dimensions. I mean, Quine uses it a lot himself, actually. But anyway, um, it's this thing. It's supposed to be an upside-down iota, the Greek letter iota. It looks like a kind of candy cane or something. So, um, the truth is that even in the reduction of the rational numbers to natural numbers, in fact, even the definition of addition, in fact, even the definition of the number two, <laughs> um, this definite description operator has, we have to already be allowed to use it if it's going to count as reduction. Because, for example, you know, remember at the foundation of arithmetic, we had this one relation, the successor relation, that means x is the next number after y. And we had, let's say, I mean, the truth is with the definition just definite description operator, you don't need this, but let's say we start with the name for one number, one. And now we want to define two. So how can we define two? Well, we know that um, two, that is, we want it to come out true that two is, yeah, the two is the successor of one. But this isn't a definition of two, right? Like this doesn't tell me, you know, <coughs> what to write instead of two. So really to define two, you need to say something like 2 is, and this is where the definite description operator comes in. The x such that x is the successor of 1. The one and only number which is the successor of 1. That's the name of a number, and now I can put it in here. 
1 plus 1 equals the one and only number that's the successor of 1. This would be part of the definition of addition, <laughs> um, or the introduction of the addition symbol. But so, um, right, so, so an expression like this is read the x such that blah, 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 something about x. And it means the one and only x that fulfills the condition in here. So I think Carnap imagines defining this relation f like this, the f such that, well, actually, Actually, let me call this f. This is going to be the definition of f. f is the best g. f is the g such that g is best for my experiences, given all those criteria. That's what the definition is supposed to be. Right? So every time we see something like f, you know, um, 0, 1, 1.5, red. Right, which is supposed to mean we assign the color red to this point. Every time we see that, we replace it with the G that is the best G for my experiences assigns the color red to that point. Right, and now f is gone. So that's the eliminative, eliminative definition. So that's how Carnap thinks he can get past this gap. And like I said, it's not that unreasonable for him to think he's allowed to do this because you have to do it even to define addition. Um, on the other hand, there's problems with doing it, especially in this case, because as you can imagine, right, so this operator means, you know, here's the letter phi again for people who didn't know what that is. If this operator means the x that feeds. The one and only x that feeds. Well, suppose either there's no x that feeds or there's more than one, then this expression doesn't clearly mean anything. Right, so like when Russell discusses definite descriptions, one example he gives is the present king of France. So Ryan is asking, why don't we learn this anymore? I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I'm getting at the problems for why people don't want it to count as a logical symbol necessarily. Although, I mean, recent very important people have continued to use it and think it's fine, including David Lewis especially, you know, uses it in his version of this very thing, actually. It's in a paper called How to Define Theoretical Concepts. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, it's not considered part of elementary logic because it has problems with it. And like I'm saying, here's the problem. If phi is like is the present king of France, then this expression means the present king of France. But there is no king of France. So what does it mean? And then when you put it into something else, right, something that's supposed to take a person as an argument, like is bald, I think, is... Uh, Russell's example, the present king of France is bald. Is that true or false? Well, it's, you know, there is no present king of France. I, <laughs> right? So, um, but it's also bad if you say something like, you know, um, um, 
the present person in France. The present person in France is, the, that is, the French person is bald. Well, I mean, there's lots of French people. So again, it's not clear what this expression would mean, the French person. And so that it's so so you can't assign a truth value to the proposition. So in the case of the definition of one, I'm sorry, the definition of two, the number that is the successor of one, well, one of the piano axioms says that every natural number has a unique successor. So you can prove that there's exactly one number that's the successor of one. And so you can prove that this is meaningful and then you can use it with a clear conscience, so to speak. But here, it doesn't seem like we can prove that there's one best solution. In fact, it seems like it's a matter for, we shouldn't be able to prove it because it's an empirical question. Not in the sense that it's, you could do, you know, like apply for a NSF grant to study this because if this problem can't be solved, you're in trouble. You don't see a world, right? <laughs> you have bigger problems than getting money from the NSF. Right? But it's an empirical question in the sense that, you know, I only know, like I said, how do we know that this problem is soluble? Because we solve it all the time, pretty well, most of the time. Sometimes we're confused about what we see or there's illusions, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so it depends on certain empirical facts whether this definition was good or not. So the question is, I guess, between Carnap and Quine, and I'll talk about more when we get to Quine's criticism, is whether Carnap is allowed to have that kind of thing or not. The, a similar question, problem is going to come up in the same way already in Goodman. So. Um, I hope that was somewhat clear. I don't absolutely don't have more time to talk about this. I spent more time on it than I should, but um, um, okay, that's that's what I'm going to say about it for now. Okay, so now I want to talk about um, the question I wrote at the beginning. Um, what's up with this book? <laughs> and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, Carnap says a lot of things in this book, even just in the part that I signed you to read. He talks about all kinds of stuff. Um, um, it doesn't all seem like it's important from the point of view of a single project. Right, it seems like some of the things he says are things he thinks are interesting, but, you know, um, or maybe even really important for some purpose. But if he's wrong about them, it wouldn't change that much about the book. Right, it's like it wouldn't affect the overall project. So, I mean, you know, some of those things he he's pretty clear about, although it can be easy to forget. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think he everywhere emphasizes, for example, that if the details of the constructional system turn out to be 
um, inadequate to the actual results of empirical science, that's not a big deal. This is just a beginning attempt at this. What he really wants to just to show is that such a system is possible in principle. But he does spend a lot of time on those details, so he's clearly interested in those. They're just not the main point, right? So, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. So that, you know, um, the um, to some extent, also, I mean, I didn't have you read maybe the most important sections for this, but. To some extent, some of the things he says in the book even seem to contribute to conflicting projects. Maybe not contradictory exactly, but like things you would want to do for different reasons or something. Um, so, um, so to make anything of this book, we have to try to figure out um, what in it is really important to Carnap? And one of the suggested uh, paper, or no, I can't, is it a, I think it's one of the suggested paper topics. I don't remember if there's an exam question about this, but anyway, like is, is you know, about sorting out which, what Carnap is doing because of what. Um, what he really cares about and so forth. So I'm going to, anyway, I'm going to say something about that now. Um, so you might think that the main point of the book was idealist, right? That the main point of the book was to show that what there really is is my experience and that everything else is just a convenient way of talking about my experience. Right? In which case the book would uh, be a kind of solipsistic version of Barclay would be the conclusion. Um, that, you know, um, Maybe the real Barclay is a solipsistic version of Barclay, but never mind that. <laughs> so, I mean, right, the point would be that all my words stand for my ideas and they can't, in Barclay's terminology, and they can't stand for anything else. So I must admit that that's all there really is. And, you know, I mean, I think I've talked about the, the book all along in such a way as to kind of try to head off that interpretation, but I mean, there are definitely times when it sounds like Carnap is saying that, like in section um, 160, oh no, in section, well, I mean, first of all, the whole thing about quasi-objects sounds like that, right? There are objects and there are quasi-objects that we treat as objects, but it's a fiction. So the objects are my experiences and the quasi-objects that we treat as objects, but it's a fiction, are everything else. Um, here's something. This is a section I didn't assign. Section 162. I'm just going to read. So he's imagining this scenario. Imagine that um, only fixed stars of equal brightness and color are visible. So I look up in the sky and I see a whole bunch of indistinguishable points of light. None of them are brighter than the others and none of them are different color than the others. And I guess there's no moon. <laughs> So, uh, if we are now asked for the number of object types, we would have to answer that we notice objects of only one type. We would not become doubtful about the, um, sorry. 
We would not become doubtful about the justification of this answer if someone who had to, were to object. No, there are quite a number of different object types that can be noticed. To begin with, the stars themselves. Secondly, the distances between any two, two stars. Third, the relations in size between any two distances. Fourth, the triangles of any three stars. Blah, 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 and so on and so forth. The constellations, whatever. Right? We would say, no, there's only one kind of object. They are stars. And then there's different things you can say about them of varying levels of complexity. So if that's supposed to be analogous to the constructional system, right? Like, in that case... Um, at least, is this really true? It's at least when you first think about it, you might say, look, there's no temptation to choose a different basis or something. The objects that are really there are the stars. And the other things are just ways of talking about the stars. Um... Like I said, maybe even in that case, it's not completely obvious. Maybe somehow the distances come first. Or at least you could start with the distances instead, you know, and so forth. But, um, but in any case, uh, like that analogy seems to run in that direction. Another thing that seems to run in that direction, and this was in the assigned reading when he talks about the psychophysical problem with respect to other people, and why there isn't a psychophysical psycho problem with respect to other people. So the psychophysical problem with respect to other people would be why do they always have a certain psychological state when their body's in a certain state and vice versa? How do we explain that? And Carnap says, but there's no problem there because we construct their psychological state based on the state of their body. So they have to go together, right? We're using the method of indicators, that is the method of necessary and sufficient conditions for the uh, knowledge that an object is there. So when the body is in the state that we use to construct the psychological state, Right, like in the case of anger that I discussed last time where we use the angry behavior of the body to construct the predicate angry. We translate a sentence like Uncle Rudy is angry into a sentence like Uncle Rudy's body dis displays anger behavior. That is, displays behavior, blah, 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 all listed out <laughs> what the behavior is. So there's no mystery why Uncle Rudy is angry exactly when his body shows that behavior because that's the definition of Uncle Rudy being angry. And Carnap adds this uh, like parable or analogy or something that explains why this would be a foolish question to ask. And he says, it's as if someone accustomed themselves to imagining an angry Zeus every time they heard thunder. So it's a myth, right? Every time they hear thunder and then they start asking, boy, why is it that there's thunder if and only if Zeus is angry? Um... So it sounds like the other person's psychological states are a myth, <laughs> right? I've accustomed myself to imagining something every time I see uh, another human body behaving in a certain way. What do I imagine? Well, I probably imagine my own feeling of anger, right? Like I remember it. I imagine a certain sympathetic feeling um, right, similar to the person who every time they hear thunder imagines seeing a certain thing, right, like a big angry guy with lightning bolts and whatever, right? I imagine feeling a certain thing. I imagine feeling anger when I see a body doing something like this. And so I start to think there's something to explain about why the anger is there 
whenever the body does this. But really, the anger is there. That's because of my own irrational associations or whatever, right? Like, when I talk about psychological states for scientific purposes, I have to disregard those associations I have and con concentrate on the logical value of the statement. And the logical value of the statement, Uncle Rudy is angry, is identical to the logical value of the statement, his body is in such and such it behaves in such and such a way. And those things I'm imagining are, you know, maybe useful for my practical purposes, but they don't have anything to do with um, actually um, talking about Uncle Rudy's psychological state and it's saying things about it that can be either true or false. So, I mean, um, to some extent, that's definitely true, right? Like the last things I was saying are, you know, Carnap says for the constructional system, we only concentrate on the logical value because that's what's needed by science, you know, or whatever. Um, but the question is, should we then say, so we've proved that the psychological states are mythical. And actually it would turn out that the other person's body is mythical too, right? Because it's also constructed out of my experiences. And even most of the things I say about my own experiences are, are mythical, except for the fundamental relation of remembered similarity. That's what there really is. <laughs> um, so, like, if we went in the way that those, like, stories or analogies or whatever seem to go towards the point of this book is idealism, then the most important thing um, would be, number one, to get the right basis, right? Because the question of choosing the basis would be the question of deciding what things there really are. We better sure we, we be sure we did it right. Otherwise, we're going to prove the wrong things exist and the wrong things don't exist. That would be important. Um, number two, it would be import important to... Um, um, get the right ascension forms, that is, get the right way of going from one level of the constructional system to the next. Um, and the way um, should be, or at least could be, the way I actually um, decide whether to say a certain object is there or not. Because it's on the basis of that that I'm going to be able to understand that, that the object I'm talking about is really a quasi-object, that it's mythical. So, right, I'm going to have to, to, to see how I could actually change my way, right? So like the person who says um, there's an angry Zeus when they hear thunder, um, to get them to not believe in the angry Zeus anymore, you have to tell them how they actually, you have to point out to them how they actually decide whether there's an angry Zeus or not. You say, look, you know, this is when you say that Zeus is angry. You say Zeus is angry when you hear thunder and only when you hear thunder. So it really means the same thing as I hear thunder. So you really don't believe in such a thing as an angry Zeus. You really believe in your own experience of hearing thunder. And, you know, then the result of all of this would be um, um, number one, I could convince myself that solipsistic idealism is true, I guess. Um, well, there's something pretty weird about that. Uh, 
I mean, because Carnap couldn't convince me because there is no Carnap. Carnap is a myth. <laughs> but, uh, um, but anyway, I can convince myself of that. And number two, I could use this to um, make sure I don't say anything meaningless. So I, that is, I could use it to do what before I called policing science, or right? Like I could use it to, I think I used that phrase before. Anyway, if not, I'm introducing it now. I could use it to police science. I could use it to take things that I'm tempted to say and say, you know, look, either this is a myth with a grain of truth or it's a myth that's all myth. It's just emotion and association, basically, right? If it's a main myth with a grain of truth, I have to translate it into statements about the basis of the system that is about my experiences, and that will show what it really means about the things that really exist. And if it's a myth without a grain of truth, that is one that can't be translated that way, then I know that it doesn't mean anything. So, you know, I do think that Carnap was um, attracted to some theses like these, maybe not the solipsistic version, or maybe even that. I mean, um, it probably depends how he understood Husserl, uh, what he thought Husserl was successful in doing or not. Anyway, I mean, I think... Carnap was attracted to some uh, theses like this at some point before and maybe even during his early work on the Aufbau. Um, I mean, I don't have any definite evidence for that. Except, well, I mean, there are certain things in his notes. Um, it's like a plan of the Aufbau that what became the Aufbau from very early on that sounds kind of idealistic. Um, so, so I have a feeling, and then also there's the fact that Russell, you know, who he's also working with sometimes seems attracted to a view like this. Um, so, you know, um, so there may really be some traces of that left in the way he talks sometimes or something like that. But in the Aufbaus we have it now, I just have to remind you, again, number one, we have to choose the basis. He says, choose a different basis for different purposes. For our purpose here, we're choosing, we want an epistemically ordered system, so we're going to choose this auto-psychological basis. But for other purposes, a different basis might be more convenient. The first thing um, we'll see next week is that um, he... Um, has decided that you should always use a materialistic or physical basis. Right? He gives up on the idea that we should get empiricism in by, by having this epistemically ordered system with uh, the basis in what's ep epistemically primary. Um, I mean, that part is still there in what's called the protocol language, and I'll have to talk about that, but the, the constructional system itself, um, very early on, he abandons this auto-psychological basis. But the point is, even here, right, like if the point of the book were what I was saying at first, that would mean completely giving up on his project and starting a completely different project, right? If his project was to show that idealism is true, and then a few years later he says, oh, we should reduce everything to a physical basis, then he's changed from thinking idealism is true to thinking that, like, physicalism is true. Um, 
Okay, there's some questions in direct message, which I can't really answer now. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the truth is that even in the Aufbau, he already said that this basis is good for certain purposes, but for other purposes, you should choose a different basis. And, you know, not only does which things end up being the objects and which things end up being the quasi-objects change as you go from one of the proposed systems to another, but even... I think I said this before, but I'll say it again. Even which objects belong to the same type and which objects belong to different type changes, right? Because two of the systems he considers, one is the one with the auto-psychological basis. Eigenpsychologisch, like own psychological. And the other is with the hetero psychological basis. Well, actually, I guess the other is just psychological. Right, so the one he chose, chose has the auto-psychological basis. So in the auto-psychological basis, I first construct the realm of my own experiences. Then based on that, I construct the physical world. And then based on the physical world, I construct the um, psychological states of others, the heteropsychological realm, right? So the order is, you know, auto-psychological, physical, Heteropsychological. But the psychological basis, which he also considers, he says isn't appropriate for our purposes, but is a perfectly viable basis for a constructional system. The psychological um, order would combine both of these and make them together the basis of the system. Right, so every statement about the physical world are going to be reduced to statements about everyone's experience. This is, as Carnap says, related to something that Russell tried to do at some point. Right, so, I, um, and obviously this is going to be a lot easier. Right, if I have everyone's experiences to start with, rather than just my visual field, I'm going to have everyone's. It's going to be a lot easier to solve the problem. Carnap says, yeah, that's a good way to go. But you notice then that in changing from one to the other, on our system, you know, my basic experience is the fundamental type. Someone else's basic experience is something that constructed on the basis of the motions of their body. So it's a completely different type, much, much higher in the system. And based on the interpretation that he's an idealist, we would be saying, this one is real, this one is fiction. But then he says, oh, oh, or you can choose this system. In this system, this also belongs to the basis, right? So, so I, the whole point here in this context anyway, is to show that um, you can take him at his word, I think, when he says that no metaphysical judgment of reality is implied in choosing my fundamental experiences as the basis. And the terms object and quasi-object are logical, not metaphysical terms. They don't say that the objects really exist and the quasi-objects don't. They just say that the quasi-objects relative to this basis are not actually objects. That is, the words for them can be eliminated to this basis. But there, you could choose a different basis, and then everything will change. And so what is the same here when you change from one to the other? What's the same here is the realm of everyday life and science that we're assuming is already in good shape. 
because we see there's responsible attitude manifested there. We assume it's already in good shape. There's different ways of reconstructing it. It doesn't matter, or it matters um, which one we choose, but which one is best depends on our purpose. It's a practical question. Um, number two is, and I've already alluded to several times, Rational reconstruction. Right? Carnap says over and over again that it doesn't matter um, how we actually um, solve this, solve a certain problem, how we actually tell that something is a rattlesnake or not how we actually tell whether there's a colored surface in front of us based on what's on our visual field. Right, like in parentheses after that point one, he mentions binocular vision. The way we actually tell has a lot to do with binocular vision. We don't really have just one visual field to work with. We have two and we compare them to each other. Carnap says it's not necessary to go into that here. Um, because working with just the one visual field, we can solve the problem, and that's good enough. It doesn't have to have anything to do with the way the problem is actually solved in real life. Well, see, when Quine talks about this, he's you know he says, "Why all this make believe?" <laughs> right? It's 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 a fictional story about how we tell whether a certain thing is there or not. All it has to do is yield the right truth conditions. Right. So in other words, like as long as um, there's a rattlesnake there gets eliminated in, in favor of a sentence that's true in all the cases where we would normally say there's a rattlesnake there and not in any others, we're fine. It doesn't matter how you did it. So um, um, now it's going to get eliminated in terms of epistemically more primary stuff, right? So it's going to get eliminated ultimately in, in, in the direction of my experiences, right? So it's something you can say about my experiences that's true in exactly the cases where I would say there's a rattlesnake there. But it doesn't have to single out the feature of my experiences that I actually use to recognize rattlesnakes. It could be something else that I don't notice, but it's always there in my experience, only if and only if there's a rattlesnake. You can use that and you're done. Right? So that again shows that sorry, I'll cut that, out. that again shows that the point here is not like to convince you that, that your, all your talk about rattlesnakes is mythical. Because to do that, you would have to, again, like in the Zeus Thunder case, I would have to show how, when you, I would have to show you, you know, what it is that really makes you say there's a rattlesnake there. It's really just these experiences that I've, that, and I can show you which ones. And so you shouldn't believe in rattlesnakes. But that's not the purpose, and that's why Carnap doesn't care if it's the way you really do it. Um, number three, also something I've emphasized before. We're waiting for empirical science. This has something to do with the problem that I was mentioning about the, you know, introducing the relation F and so forth. Um, we're, you know, um, in parts of the constructional system that are not finished. There are parts that not, are not finished because they can't be finished. Because to be finished, we have to, science would have to tell us enough about the object so that we could figure out how we can recognize them. And that hasn't been done yet. So, um, so, 
So like from that solipsistic, idealistic point of view, that wouldn't make any sense. Or idealist point of view, that wouldn't make any sense. Right? One of the things that I'm supposed to show as a myth is empirical science. With all its institutions and scientists and whatever, that's all a myth. I can't be waiting for the results from that to tell you how to do it. I have to show you how to do it now. <laughs> and moreover, I think this shows that, you know, the fact that we're waiting for the results of empirical science to do this shows that we can't use this to police science. Right? Like, suppose, you know, the scientist says something like, um, um, you know, uh, birds are dinosaurs. Birds and, or, that's a bad example. Um, Suppose the scientist says something like, the halibut mates in the spring. <laughs> and I say, um, oh yeah? Translate that into sentences about your own experience. So the scientist can say, we haven't, we're, we're not done with that yet. We don't know. And I don't say, aha, metaphysics. I say, okay, I'll check back with you when you have it figured out, <laughs> right? So, um, so this can't be used to take like apparent statements of science and show that they're really metaphysics. Um, How can we rule out some things as metaphysics then? Well, it's going to be the, have to be the case that the metaphysicians, so, you know, so I remember, remember the conversation I imagined with the scientist. I go up and say, you know, scientist says the halibut mates in the spring. And I say, oh yeah, can you translate that into a statement about your own experiences? And they say, uh, well, um, uh, how would I do that? And I say, well, first translate it into a statement about the motion of colored surfaces in space. And I say, you know, I'm sorry, we need to do a lot more work on halibuts before I can tell you that. <laughs> right? Um, that's pretty far from, like, our knowledge of halibuts is not that complete. So I say, you know, okay, I'll check back with you when you know more. <laughs> But now imagine I go up to the metaphysician and the metaphysician says, like, this pen really exists. And I say, oh yeah, can you translate that into a sentence about your own experiences? They're gonna say, of course not, that's not an empirical statement. That can never be translated into a sentence about my own experiences. It's a metaphysical truth about the pen. Right? So at that point, even though the whole system is not finished and we can't do any of these translations, really, um, I already know that what the metaphysician wants to say is um, not constructible because they've told me their intention not to accept any translation into the constructional system of what they're saying. So the idea is that the difference between the scientist and the metaphysician is a difference of like intention. Um, what it is that they're in principle willing to accept as a translation, as a test of what they're saying, as a way of settling disagreements about what they're saying. Um, I wanted to add one more thing to this list. It's important, but I guess not as important as the other thing I need to say. So, um,
So what's wrong with metaphysics is, I mean, so, so like, first of all, you know, that again shows that the purpose of this is not to tell you how to really translate everything you think is about physical objects into statements about your experience. The point is to get you to take a certain attitude towards the way you talk about physical objects, for example. And the attitude is that um, what I say about them can be, in principle, everything I say about them can be proved or disproved by consulting my experiences. Um, and therefore, in principle, I'm willing to accept a translation of my sentences about physical things into a language that only describes my experiences. And what this expresses is not a metaphysical um, fact about my experiences, that they're realer than other things. It expresses a practical fact about me that I'm willing to put my statements on the line and let them be tested by experience. Um, so, um, so the problem with metaphysics, on the other hand, is a practical problem. The metaphys metaphysicians are taking, have an irresponsible attitude. And this word attitude, sometimes uh, Rolf George, the translator, translates it as orientation. There's also a couple other words that he sometimes translates as attitude and sometimes as orientation, but this is the main one, handling. Oh, sorry, not handling. Yes. Handling is action. Haltung. Right? Haltung means attitude. It means like the, the way you hold yourself, right? It's... Halton is the cognate of the English verb to hold, right? So your, your like attitude, like the way you hold yourself, um, 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 Carnap says, um, I, I don't really have time in the next two minutes to talk about this properly. I guess I'm going to have to let this go over until next time. This is so important. Um, but that's bad because I'm slipping behind. But in any case, so um, I'll just read you like from the preface, from the end of the preface. Oh, is that the right thing to read if there's only one thing? Yeah, I guess, no, it's too late. Um, We do not deceive ourselves about the fact that movements in metaphysical philosophy and religion, which are critical of such an uh, orientation, in this case it's Einstellung, such orientation have again become very influential of late. Whence then our confidence that our call for clarity, for a science that is free from metaphysics will be heard? It stems from the knowledge or insight or to put it somewhat more carefully from the belief now so in German there's one word Glaube which is translated in English both as belief and as faith at, at the very end of the preface Carnap uses the same word and uh, the translator there has faith 
up here he has belief. I'm going to say faith. So from the knowledge, or to put it somewhat more carefully, from the faith that these opposing powers belong to the past, we feel that there is an inner kinship between the attitude on which our philosophical work is founded and the intellectual attitude, Haltung, which presently manifests in itself in entirely different walks of life. And then skipping to the bottom... Our work is carried by the faith that this attitude, in this case it's Gesinnung, but it's whatever. Our work is carried forward by the faith that this attitude will win the future. Um, this is the same thing he talks about again towards the very end in the section about knowledge and faith. And he says that, you know, outside of theoretical science, there still are important practical questions. They, they're not theoretical questions, but um, the um, answer to them is a matter of adopting the right attitude or halting, and that's the proper object of faith. So um, this is a version of Kant's, um, the foundations of Kantian ethics. But I'll have to say more about it in detail next time, and I will see you then.